I'm Charles Adam Foster Simard from Ubisoft. You're listening to The Tenth Art, a podcast about video games and their place in culture and society. In our new season this fall, we're going to take a new topic every two weeks and discuss it with a Ubisoft developer and an invited guest from outside Ubisoft. Science and video games. It seems like the perfect match, right? Video game developers use cutting-edge tech and math to make games and make sure that their games look and perform better. It is, after all, computer science. But does that relationship go deeper? Can video game developers learn from science to create innovative gameplay mechanics? And can scientists leverage the power of games to push their own understanding of the world even further? Do scientists and game makers really leverage what the other has to offer? Today, I'm really happy to welcome David Loapre, scientific director at Ubisoft, based in Paris, and Dr. Janice Bailey, scientific director at the Fonds de Recherche du Québec, Nature et Technologie. David and Dr. Bailey, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Hello. Uh, it's lovely to be here. I wish I was in Paris, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we're recording this in the summer, and it's excessively hot in Paris today. So I don't think you, I don't think you want to be with us. <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe we should start by just introducing yourself briefly. So maybe, David, you can begin. Can you explain a little bit what your background is, what your scientific expertise is in, and, and what you currently do at Ubisoft? Yeah, so I'm, I'm David Loapre. I'm scientific director uh, at Ubisoft. Uh, and I'm kind of uh, not really a newbie in the video game industry, but it's not my primarily uh, industry, I would say. Uh, my background is in physics. Uh, I have a PhD in, uh, in fundamental physics. I worked on things like Big Bang and the black holes uh, and the so-called theory of everything. Um, and then I, I, I left academia and I joined the industry of materials. I started doing uh, machine learning and then more material science. And then four years ago, I unexpectedly uh, joined Ubisoft. I uh, was not too much of a gamer. And now, so I'm scientific director and my main role is to help the design team to uh, incorporate new mechanics and new type of gameplay based on science and simulation. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Dr. Bailey? Because I think you are also sort of a lapsed scientist with a, with a foot still in the scientific community, of course. Yeah, so my name is Janice Bailey, and I am currently the scientific director for the Fonds de Recherche de Québec on Nature et Technologie. So that's the Quebec, province of Quebec has its own public research fund that, to support STEM research. Uh, so we fund academia, a lot of scholarships uh, for, for students to, to train, as well as a lot of uh, research grants on a huge range of STEM, so science, technology, engineering, math, biology to astrophysics, all of that. So that's, I've been doing that for just over three years now, but for 25 years, I was a professor at uh, Université Laval, so Laval University in lovely Quebec City in Canada. And I started off as professor in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences, where I worked on animal reproduction. And over the years that evolved, and I became uh, also an adjunct professor in medicine, and I worked an awful lot on how the environment affects and uh, the changing environment uh, can affect reproductive function in a wide variety of species from, I studied bees and fish and farm animals and humans, um, even polar bears. Um, so, so, so that's what I did for those 25 years before I, I came over to uh, uh, fund research. And uh, I am completely, despite my age, I'm completely new to the video games world. So this is really interesting and kind of stressful for me to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> You'll see, we'll, we'll ease you into the topic. I think it's, I think it's super fascinating. And, and I think uh, it's, it's great to have you here to, to offer your perspective on this uh, field as well. David, maybe we can start with you. And I'm wondering, you know, as a scientist, what surprised you when you joined Ubisoft? You know, did you have any preconceptions? You said you weren't a gamer. So did you have any preconceptions about video games when you first joined? And, and how did that change over time now that you've been here for four years? 
Yeah, well, well, the first shock uh, I would say is, uh, you know, uh, when I joined Ubisoft, I hadn't played video game like for the past uh, 25 years. So yeah. of course I was, you know, shocked by the, you know, the quality and so on uh, because my experience as a gamer was more like in the in the 90s, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but in in scientific terms, I, I would say I was surprised uh, by the way certain words were used. Um, I have two examples in mind, uh, which are uh, physics and artificial intelligence. Yeah. Uh, because you know when you talk about artificial intelligence in the in the field of academia uh, these days you mean things like you know machine learning and your lint works and deep learning and that kind of things and and when I, I arrived in the video game industry I understood that most of the time when people say artificial intelligence they mean something different they mean the the, the artificial intelligence of the of the non-playing characters of, of the game uh, which uh, you know today is not based on neural networks and that kind of thing for, for very good reason, uh, for predictability and because it would be too expensive in terms of, of calculation. So artificial intelligence somehow meant something different in the video mm. game world and in academia. And it was pretty much the same uh, with the word physics, which was a surprise for me because I'm a physicist. And uh, of course, you know, physics as a, as a scientific field, it's something very, very wide. Uh, it includes, uh, you know, uh, electromagnetism and thermodynamics and that kind of thing. And physics uh, in the video game world, it seems that it includes mainly Uh, gravity and collision. When people talk <laughs> about the physics of the game, they, they mean gravity and collision, mm -hmm. which of course surprised me because it was very uh, uh, small scope of physics. Sure. Uh, and of course, you know, the gap between what for me was physics and what the world was used for in, in video games was a source of, uh, you know, shock, but also opportunity and inspiration, uh, of course. And you're, you're talking about physics, and of course that's your background, and so how it's a little bit maybe more limited the way that we think about physics and video games and, and the way that developers use physics in games. Did you, and I know we're going to talk about some of your prototypes and some of the work you do uh, in a little bit, but you know, did, did you find that a lot of what was going on in the field of physics and video games was based on a scientific understanding of physics or, or not really? I would say a pretty strong understanding of that limited scope, uh, which is, you know, for instance, how you handle collisions, mm -hmm. which is... Uh done very nicely and even things like you know uh, friction of clothes on character and that kind of thing you know everything related to uh, to the quality of the movement i would say uh, was done uh, was done very well you know beyond what i would have imagined before uh, but a large part of of what is physics for me was ignored uh, you know we could say uh, heat uh, uh, fluids i mean there are a little bit of fluids in games but most of the time it's very simplistic compared to what we do in the scientific field sure. um, and yeah all that kind of uh, area of, of physics that are not uh, really used uh, in most games today Maybe we can bring Dr. Bailey into the conversation now because your background is in uh, reproductive science yeah. and biology. Mm -hmm. You know, David, maybe from your experience, are, are those sciences used at all in the video games that you've taken a look at? Or is there an interest among developers to look at that science? I would say probably this is something that was maybe uh, used uh, a little bit in some games more, games, more like good games, I would say, where, you know, you have to manage a, a whole uh, ecosystem or population from the point of view of a kind of god, and you have to manage, you know, how many animals there are and so on. Sure. Uh, but if you look at, you know, modern, like open world games like we, we do at Ubisoft, uh, there is very little on basically the, the dynamics of the population of, of animals. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is a field that should be investigated because there is a lot of Things, interesting things to be done and to be teached to players through games. Mm -hmm. You know, think about, and this probably is something that Dr. Bailey knows very well, things like, you know, uh, evolution of population with modeling like Lotka Volterra, where you describe the dynamics of species that are interacting because one is a predator and the other is a prey. Uh, and mm -hmm. to me, this is super interesting and it could be used in video game. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think the concept of, of predator-prey uh, interactions, I think, is really interesting in terms of video game play, um, from what I understand. And also, we can talk about that with animals, but you can also just talk about predicting human behavior in terms of studying or understanding how players play and their, their moves, even as they learn, they might do something. But in terms of also, um, here I'm going to make a really bad joke, but When I switched and became a, uh, the scientific director and had to learn a lot more about artificial intelligence and its place in the world, because, of course, uh, the province of Quebec, uh, Montreal, there's a lot of great research going on. And 
AI, and so that's artificial intelligence. But in my world, it was also artificial insemination, and I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I made that very embarrassing um, slip uh, of the tongue talking about artificial ins insemination when I should have been talking about artificial intelligence. But one thing that I do like, so even though you know I worked on reproductive biology and, and biology, but we studied a lot about, you know, proteins and, and protein behavior and how proteins change, especially, you know, I worked on sperm. I was a sperm lady. And so sperm are really interesting because they'll use the same proteins to do different things. And I, you know, when I learned about folded, about how proteins can be reconfigured in three dimensions, I thought, oh, my gosh, that would be so cool to have had those kind of tools when I was maybe a student or a professor. And also in terms of how genes or respond or how our cells' DNA respond to the environment, those are epigenetic changes that are really dynamic. I thought, oh, these are all really interesting strategies that, that could be applied in, in, to gamers who were really curious about how the environment could check change our bodies. So I just want to take a step back because you mentioned Folded, which is really interesting. So so mm -hmm. my understanding of it, I think, and, and David, maybe you know a little bit more than I do about it, but it's that basically researchers have created a game to help them to, to kind of leverage essentially human creativity in gamification to uh, try to see how proteins fold, right? To try to find new ways in which proteins can fold and, and potentially find, and I think they did find ways that an algorithm, for example, couldn't come up with. Yes, yeah, it's oh, wow. not really finding new ways of, uh, it's somehow finding new ways of folding it. So there is this big problem in, in biology that we know the sequence of amino acid of a protein because mm -hmm. we can somehow read it in, in the DNA, but we don't know the shape of the molecule. And you can, you have to imagine what's going to be the shape of the molecule from the sequence of uh, amino acid. Uh, and the protein, uh, it's, it's folded on itself and it's really the shape that gives the function. So understanding the shape of, mm -hmm. of protein is, is really important. And of course, there are some algorithms that try to do that and you try to minimize a somehow kind of energy. So, and, and uh, those people, uh, I think it was in 2011 or 2012, they got this great, brilliant idea to say, okay, the algorithm, they are not very good at finding the good, uh, the good f way to fold the protein. So let's leverage human creativity, as you said. And they somehow uh, had people competing in folding protein. And what's incredible is that those people, they were not at all like, you know, molecular biologists. They were just gamers. Uh, but they had, <laughs> they developed this sense of, you know, what are the good moves, a good way to, to, to deform the, the protein to try to minimize the energy and so on. And uh, somehow the, the, the culmination of this was a, a publication in, in uh, I think it was in Nature, which is uh, like the most prestigious uh, journal uh, in science about uh, the shape of a protein that they managed to find thanks to uh, all the players uh, playing the game. Uh, much better than with uh, the algorithm that existed at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a while ago. David, do you feel like that, you know, that's a, a good way to move forward and, and potentially a way in which video games can serve scientists or help scientists, as it were? So as, as, a, as, a, as a scientific director in the video game industry, I, I get the, the question very often, as you, as you can imagine. Yes. And I have to say I'm quite skeptical. Uh, I was already skeptical several years ago, <laughs> even with a folded example, because okay. I had trouble to imagine a lot of situations where this would be uh, possible. Because right. you need a very specific situation. You need a situation where the algorithms are not good enough, but players who are not experts, who no, don't know the, the scientific field, can be better than, than the algorithms. Mm -hmm. And I remember very well, like, uh, you know, four years ago, uh, when people asked me, uh, what do you think about this ID? I was thinking, you know, when those people at DeepMind who, who made this wonderful algorithm to play Go, uh, they will try to make the same to play Foldit instead of Go, they will crush everyone. Right. And uh, that somehow this is what happened, <laughs> because uh, I think it was uh, one or two years ago, uh, they released a new algorithm. So the algorithm is not playing Foldit, but it's... You know, trying to achieve the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it seems that uh, it was really a true revolution in the world of you know, protein folding. Uh, so it's called alpha fold. So I believe that most of the situation that will be handled better by deep learning algorithm or let's say machine learning algorithm than by uh, human players in the end. So my, my feeling that the, the scope of this ID, the ID is super nice, but I think the, the scope is probably very limited. Sure. And I mean, maybe the biggest strength of it is that we're talking about it today, that I think it marked the imagination and a lot of those players learned something about biology and protein folding that they wouldn't have otherwise, right? Yeah, yeah. 
I think that's one side of the conversation where it's video games that are kind of supporting the scientific community. I'm also curious to know a little bit how scientific research can kind of help video games. So I think traditionally, uh, we, we've spoken about how video games, and, and you know, we talked a little bit earlier about physics and how scientific research can help uh, developers make their games more beautiful or more realistic, or, you know, they, they use certain things like machine learning or increasingly AI uh, of, the, of the artificial intelligence kind, not of the artificial insemination kind, <laughs> 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 to develop their games. But I think we're also seeing in it, well, maybe we are seeing an increasing number of of games. I'm thinking of Breath of the Wild, for example, Zelda Breath of the Wild, where, you know, they're they're kind of inspiring themselves from physics, from chemistry to create gameplay opportunities. Yeah, I think uh, Breath of the Wild was released maybe one year before I joined Ubisoft. And I, I understand that uh, in the video game industry, uh, this game was kind of, uh, of a shock because they were probably not the first one, but the first one at this level to do a game based not only on physics uh, in the video game sense of the world, like, uh, you know, just gravity and collisions, but also adding a lot of new gameplay ingredients uh, inspired by science. So if you listen to the, to the game developer conference that they gave about how they, you know, they made the game design, they talk about it as chemistry. So actually, it's not really chemistry, but they, they use the word chemistry for everything that they added on top of, uh, of physics. And they are playing with uh, magnetism and they are playing with, with fire and uh, and wind uh, and all of the all of the things and using those systems and doing some kind of mini scientific simulation of those systems they created a lot of gameplay elements that combine together and lead to uh, incredible emergence uh, in the game mm -hmm. and you know what's fascinating about this game is that it was released in 2017 and today you still see videos that are made by, by players that do incredible things by combining the systems. And it seems that, you know, even five years after the game was released, they are able to find new ways to use the system that are in, in the games. Essentially, they created rules and systems, and then players can do things that the developers didn't necessarily plan for by using those systems, right? Yeah, they managed to combine the, the different systems. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a great example because it shows how science can be used not only uh, as, I would say, technical tool to make games, uh, you know, better, animations, nicer, and so on, but also as an inspiration for, for gameplay. And this mm -hmm. is really uh, what fascinates me and also what I'm, I'm working on. Um, and I think that, uh, of course, this relation between video games and science was old in terms of, you know, using science to make better graphics and, 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 and AI, as you said. Uh, but I think there is a new uh, opportunity here. Uh, using science as an inspiration for, for gameplay. And, you know, the, the topic of dynamics of population we were uh, mentioning uh, ju just before might be one of these examples. The biggest thing that I've been thinking about in terms of science these days is something that I know nothing about and David probably knows a lot more about is just all these fantastic new photos from the James Webb Space Telescope. And I can't help but think that... Um, that some of the technology and some of the, the aspects that are we're discovering through uh, this fantastic uh, tool must provide some kind of inspiration for a different kind of gameplay. I mean, this is not anything that I know about, but to put them together, it just seems to me so beautiful. And also, I just want to go back a little bit and say that, because I really respect what David said about the you know, his skepticism about, you know, using uh, gamers as maybe a, a tool for, for new scientific discoveries. And I, I tend to agree with him. But I think that, you know, when we, the beauty of, of video games and, and science bringing them together, not even just science, bringing anything in the, is that we're bringing research um, or bring science to society. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely agree. And I have to say this is also part of what motivated me to, to join the, the video game industry. There is something that I haven't mentioned uh, in, the, in the introduction when I was talking about my background, but I have another, I have another parallel life. I do a lot of science uh, outreach. I have a, a YouTube channel and I do a lot of uh, videos about science on YouTube. And it's amazing because uh, on YouTube, the audience is... Uh, before, I, ha I used to have a blog. And on YouTube, the audience is so much bigger there are you know hundreds of thousands of people watching those videos and when i when i learned about the video game industry 
I realized that the potential of video games is even bigger because it's, you know, millions of players and using uh, video games to do some kind of outreach, you know, whether it's uh, history or science, and it would be more science in my case, obviously, uh, I think the potential is huge. And I can take an example because you mentioned the James Webb uh, Space Telescope and, and mm -hmm. everything related to space. There is a very nice example. This is this, this video game called Kerbal Space Program. It's a, it's a video game where basically you have to build uh, rockets and, and do like space missions. Missions. And what's interesting is that they, they did some kind of simulation of the aerodynamic of, of flight and orbital movement of everything. And it's not, it's not of course, the, the truth in terms of simulation, but it's much more detailed than what we are used to in video games. And that's funny because what happens is that the players, to succeed, basically they have to learn how to make a, a rocket and how to fly it correctly. And I heard it's very difficult. <laughs> but yeah, but you know, it, it's wonderful because what happens is that when you try to, to fly your first rocket, it, it just explodes and the second <laughs> one will just explode and the third one will crash after 10 meters and so on. But you learn by trial and error. And it's, to me, it's very close to what happens in scientific research when you have, you know, this unknown phenomenon and you do some kind of experiment trying to understand it and based on your, you know, failures and so on, gain some knowledge. And I think, you know, those kind of video games where you have to solve problems in terms of, you know, problem solving and education mm -hmm. to problem solving, I think it's a, it's a really great opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I was reading uh, in preparation for this that there's like it's statistically proven even that that especially uh, girls who play games are more likely to pursue STEM careers. So I don't know if it's the the kind of scientific approach that you mentioned or just the fact that they're kind of playing with technology in order to entertain themselves. But there seems to be a connection there where where young people, you know, are, are seem to be stimulated and pushed to go into STEM when they play games. So I think it's a beautiful way to, to reach out to them and, and get more kids interested in the sciences. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, it's uh, it's learning by doing. So mm -hmm. you rely less on some kind of, you know, uh, outside models, uh, because when you read those uh, wonderful books that I love about, uh, you know, astrophysics and so on, it's always men who wrote those books. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, the, the, the power of the stereotype, we you know, is very, it's very strong. Yeah. And having those situation where you, you learn by doing and you don't rely on some kind of, you know, external figure and so on, I expect that for girls, it will be easier for them to, to identify themselves to what they are doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you know, be a, a, a good uh, a good factor to uh, to try to close to this gap that we know there is yep. uh, mm -hmm. in terms of you know STEM uh, studies. I love that expression, the power of the stereotype being so powerful, uh, David, and I completely agree with you. And so if you can provide new models or, or, or eliminate the stereotype, that's got to be a good step towards, uh, you know, increasing the presence of underrepresented groups in STEM. I think that would be great. Yeah, I could really see a huge, you know, maybe this is me showing my age again, uh, you know, thinking in the Star Trek kind of uh, idealism, but anything to increase our cultural awareness in a positive light has got to be a good thing in this day and age. Yeah, there is a, a, an interesting anecdote that I can I can share uh, about the, the power of stereotype in science. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a, I have three daughter, uh, and the, the oldest one is is fourteen. And I was discussing with her about you know the pro representation of, of women and so on. And in, in particular, we are discussing about a problem that maybe does not exist too much uh, in English, but exists uh, very much in French, which is that certain jobs, uh, the name imply that mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a male. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And like you would say, you know. Uh, un chercheur for for you know mm -hmm. whether it's uh, it's uh, male or female and she seemed not very concerned about that and I was like but you know when you when we if I say a sentence like uh, the scientist in the lab what happens in your head is that you imagine a guy uh, a, a, a man and she told me but no I don't and the reason why when I said sentence like the scientist in the lab she imagined a, a girl it's because she's reading a, a comic a comic book, a manga, uh, where the, the hero is a girl, a scientist girl. Ah. And just having this in her mind, you know, for, so for her, the word scientist, the image that was associated to that was a girl in a lab. And, you know, it's, I think if we can push that further, uh, maybe in video games as well, uh, it, can, it can be very strong against, uh, against stereotypes. 
Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Dr. Bailey, I know that you're doing a lot of work. Of course, you're in charge of a funding body that funds research, right? Mm-hmm. And so I know that you you find it very important also in terms of, of how you fund and what you fund in terms of research in Quebec to kind mm-hmm. of change things as well and, and uh, yeah. a little bit bring, bring that research into the, you know, into the new century, into the new age and, and uh, do mm-hmm. things a little bit differently. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Well, yeah. So for me, it's really important to improve, as we were talking about just now, the presence and the diversity within uh, the research community. Because if we even just talk about, you know, I don't know, superheroes and the Avengers and things like this, everybody's got their superpower, right? Mm -hmm. And one by themselves can only do so much. But when you bring the whole team together, they're, you know, invincible. And that's a really great depiction, even though it's just cartoons, about how diversity makes us stronger and makes research better. So we can't just have the same older, white, privileged male person, man, who studied at Cambridge or or Harvard or McGill or whatever. I think that's also um, important in terms of the UN has their um, uh, sustainable development goals, and there's 17, right, sustainable development goals towards a uh, more socially responsible and safer planet. And I think that, um, you know, I also like the idea of of including uh, notions about these UN Sustainable Development Goals in our calls for research um, activities. I mean, I'm not asking everybody to solve, you know, one whole development goal, you know, in two years or something like this, but at least we we can sensitize uh, the community and scientific community about Mm -hmm. this challenge that we have. And this is where I would see that video games could be such a great platform or David's YouTube <laughs> channel. <laughs> so I think all this concept of, of social responsibility in, in science is, is really important and increasing accessibility of science to, to people who might not be so privileged to live in urban area. And so that's why I mm-hmm. think video games can be really great. Knowledge is power, right? And no matter where you learn, whether you're learning from a YouTube science channel, which is great, or through a video game, all this is very helpful. Well, let's dream a little bit. I, I want to ask you both a, the same question because, you know, you're both from, from specific fields in science, but you also follow a lot of kind of scientific learning and research th- from your jobs. And so I'm just curious, you know, where do you see opportunities? Where do you see cool cool stuff happening in sciences that would be great to feed into video games that would really enrich uh, and inspire maybe uh, game developers? Let's, let's dream a little. David, you want to start? Yeah, well, I'll go. I'll go with the easy answer. I think uh, you know we have a little problem those days with with climate change, yeah. and I think we have to somehow make sure that people understand the consequences and and somehow the systemic uh, thinking that goes behind the fact that uh, all those systems are interconnected and so on, and actions here can have an impact there, and so and, and interactions between you know climate and species and, and human activities and so on. And I think this kind of systemic thinking can be somehow teached uh, at least a little bit through, through video games because this is something that video games do very well. Yeah. So I think, I mean, this is an obvious, uh, to me, huge area of opportunity. Dr. Bailey, what about you? Yeah. Yeah, I would I would build right on that. Absolutely. You know, we're right now uh, having another COP that's going to be happening in Montreal in December, COP 15, on biodiversity, mm. the biodiversity crisis. And so this is the same kind of thing. And I think games are really good at bringing really complex areas together, showing about how one uh, change in one part of society can impact something else. And we're experiencing that now, you know, post-COVID or and also with the geopolitical uh, tensions that are happening right now uh, in the Ukraine and Russia and across the world. You know, supply chain um, issues that we might think are really unimportant and trivial mm-hmm. actually can have huge impacts in other in other areas around the world, you know, um, to talking about food supply and things like this. I mean, I think that there could be a lot of really interesting illustrations that could be fleshed out uh, through video games. So again, climate change, biodiversity, and just anything to do with the, the whole supply chain could be very interesting to look at. And it's true that that's the, the strength of video games, right? It's a, it's yeah. a form of art that's interactive. And so it, it's kind of built in naturally that there you, you do certain actions and th- those things have consequences. And so it can really teach about those sometimes far-reaching consequences that you wouldn't necessarily plan for, yeah. like in real life. 
Yeah, and I think this is, we really have to build on what the specificity of, of video games is. Mm. Uh, you know, for instance, again, if I take the climate change example, I don't want to make, I don't want to do a game where it's a kind of, you know, catastrophic game and, sure. and, and mm -hmm. all bad things happen because of climate change. Uh, because, you know, Uh, movies are doing this already very well. So what can we do that is specific to video games? Mm. And as you said, uh, video games are interactive. And so we can teach things like, okay, if I do this, this happens. And, and this is something that is harder to, to somehow uh, do with, with uh, movies. And, uh, you know, sometimes I try to, to summarize this in this way that is probably too crude. But, uh, you know, movies, they are good to explain we have a problem. And video games uh, are good to explain maybe there are solutions. Mm. So I love that because I am always sick and tired of, and even when I was, a, even when I was doing my own research, uh, you know, I studied the effect of contaminants on the, on health, right? But I didn't just do that. I always, and I think this was actually helpful to my research career, but I also looked to see if there were ways that we could protect against these negative impacts, right? It was because I was sick to death of these doomsday scenarios. Mm. It's like having solution-based games or strategies. I love that, how to get out of a, a problem situation. Well, Dr. Bailey, David, thank you so much for joining us today and for participating in this conversation. It was very enlightening, super interesting. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Tenth Art. I'm Charles Adam Foster Simard from Ubisoft. Special thanks to our guests today, David Loipre and Dr. Janice Bailey. Make sure you don't miss any of our episodes as they come out. Subscribe or follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Ubisoft.com slash the 10th art podcast.